In this module, we are going to be talking about interest rates and discount rates. We are going to walk through from some simple interest rates, compound interest rate, continuous compounding. We're going to talk about a situation where the lending rate is going to be different from the borrowing rate. Uh, we're going to talk about a little bit about term structures of interest rates and set up the, all the notation that is necessary for going into pricing forwards, futures, and options, and so on. So let's start from the very beginning. Simple and compound interest. So simple interest is defined as a situation where an amount A invested for N periods at simple interest rate of R per period is worth A times 1 plus N times R at maturity. So what's happening, the way to think about this is you've got an amount A. At every given, you start off, you invested this amount A at time, let's say, 0. At any given time, you get all the, the interest rate that you have accumulated on this is A times R. R is the rate of interest. A is the total amount of money. So at time 1, you are given A times 1 plus R. Time 2, you have accumulated another A, and so on. And when you come to time N, then the amount of money that you invested, A, is returned back to you, plus all the interest rates that you accumulated along the way. So that's 1 plus N times R. This is the total amount of money that you get back. An amount A invested for N periods at compound interest rate of R per period is worth A times 1 plus R, the whole bracket raised to the power N at maturity. And here what is happening is that you start off at time 0 with an amount A that you've invested. At time 1, you get A times 1 plus R back. So pretend as if at, after one period, you take your amount principal that you'd invested and the interest that you got, which is R times A, and take it back. So it's A, 1 plus R. Now you take the whole amount of money and invest it again for one period at a simple interest rate of R per period. So now you get A times 1 plus R squared back. Now you take this amount of money, invest it for the next period. So you get A, 1 plus R cubed back, and so on, and at time N, if you walk out the math, you'll get A 1 plus R to the power N. So the compound interest rate, the way to you think about it is basically you take the amount at every period, you're reinvesting the principal and all the interest that you have accumulated. And that's why there's a big difference between what happens in simple and compound. In the course, we're going to talk about different rates at which compounding. So here I've given you an example where R is the interest rate per period, and I'm going to compound every period. What happens if the compounding is not done every year, or maybe it's done every quarter, or every six months, or every three months? So we have to have some consistent method of stating what is the interest rate and what is the time period over which the compounding is being done. So in this course, we are going to assume that all interest rates are going to be stated on annual basis. So if there are n compounding periods in every year, then the interest rate for the relevant period is just going to be the interest rate for the year divided by n. If there are m years over which the compounding is going on, then the number of compounding periods is m times n. So here is the number of periods over which you're compounding. Here's the interest rate per period. And therefore, the total compound interest becomes a times 1 plus r, whole raised to the power m times n. So let me give you an example. Suppose r was 5% per year per annum or year. It's the same thing. All interest rates are going to be quoted in this course on a per year basis. And you're investing $100 for one year compounded six monthly. So you're investing it for one year. The compounding period is every six months. And the interest rate is 5% per year. So what do you do? How many compounding periods do you have? Since the compounding is done every six months, there are two compounding periods. What is the interest rate per period? It's the annual divided by 2, because there are two compounding periods in the, in the total period that you're thinking about, in the total year. So the interest rate would be total amount of money that you'll get at the end would be 1 plus r divided by 2 to the power 2. This is for one year compounded every six months. Now, if you were doing the same thing, compounding every six months, but investing it for two years, now the amount of money that you'll get back is 1 plus r over 2 
because now since the compounding is every six months, you have to take the annual rate and divide it by two. But now you have to figure out how many compounding periods are there. In two years, there are four compounding periods. So the amount of money that you'll get back is one plus R over two to the power four. So this is two years compounded six monthly, compounded every six months. It'll turn out to be very useful um, towards the later part of this course when we are talking about going between from discrete time to continuous time to think about the situation where the number of compounding periods in every year go to infinity or the period over which you compound goes to zero the compounding period goes to zero so what you want to do is figure out how much what will be the compound interest if the number of periods n goes to infinity so it's going to be a times 1 plus r over n to the power mn. I'm just taking the formula and now I want to take the limit of n going to infinity. And for those of you who have worked with these limits of this kind, you can easily convince yourself that this limit is nothing but a times e raised to the power rm. So this bracket in here becomes equal to e raised to the power rm. And therefore in continuous compounding over m years at, at an interest rate of r per year, the amount of money that you return you, that is given back to you at maturity is the amount of money A times E raised to the power Rm. So from this slide, what I want you to remember is simple and compound, and later on when we talk about continuous compounding, we'll remind you uh, how the continuous compounding came to be. Okay. What we want to do next is price a, a cash flow. So we want to look, figure out, based on the interest rates, what is the value of a deterministic cash flow that pays C0, C1, C2, and so on, up through Cn in different years. So C0 is a cash flow at time uh, year 0, C1 is in year 1, and so on. And remember, our convention is Ck is positive, it's inflow, and negative, it's outflow. For those of you who have seen um, present values before, we already know that the way to price this uh, cash flow is to take the different amounts and discount them by the relevant compound interest rate. So C0, which is the cash flow at time zero, or year zero, will not be discounted. Cash flow at the end of one year will be discounted by one plus R. Cash flow at the end of two years will be discounted as one plus R squared. Cash flow at time N will be discounted by one plus R to the power N. What we want to do is make a justification for why this formula holds. And in the next slide, we are going to generalize this formula for the case where borrowing and lending rates might be different. So here's a, in this slide, we're going to talk about a no arbitrage argument for figuring out why this present value is the correct price for the cash flow. So suppose we can borrow or lend at the rate R, unlimited amount. So what we're going to do in order to construct the price for this portfolio is to create, a com create this cash flow together with something else such that the cash flows in the future years are all equal to zero. And then we're going to look at what happens to cash flow at time zero. So we're going to buy the cash flow, so buy this contract, and then we are going to borrow CK over 1 plus RK for K years. So in year one, uh, I'll have to return CK over R, one, C1 over 1 plus R to the times 1 plus R and so on. And that's what we're going to do in the next line. So the cash flow in year K is going to be the positive CK. That's coming from the contract because I've bought the contract, I get a cash flow of CK. I've borrowed CK over 1 plus RK up to the year K. And because the interest rate is R, the amount of money that I have to return in year K is going to be the amount that I borrowed times 1 plus R to the K. So this is the compound interest rate up to the year K. So this is the amount that I borrowed times the interest rate. This is the amount that I'll have to return. The 1 plus R to the power K and 1 plus R to the power K cancel. And you end up getting CK minus CK equal to 0. So in the future, the cash flow that I get from this portfolio that I've constructed is exactly equal to zero. I have no obligations in the future. And now I want to understand what is the cash flow at time zero. So at time zero, I have to buy the cash flow. So minus P is the cash flow, meaning I have to pay P dollars in order to buy this contract. The rest of the terms here, the C zero term is coming from the fact that because I've bought the contract, I immediately get a cash flow of C zero. And the rest of the terms here are the borrowing amount, the amount that I have borrowed at time zero. The no arbitrage condition says that the cash flow at time zero must be less than equal to zero. 
Let's wait a minute here to try to argue again why this must be true. Suppose the cash flow in year zero is going to be strictly positive, which means that by constructing this portfolio, I can get strictly positive amount today, and I don't owe anything in the future. If that is the case, then the person who is selling me this cash flow, the person from whom I'm going to buy the cash flow, is going to realize that they could charge me a slightly higher price and I would still buy it because it's still a, a pure profit for me. And they will continue increasing the price, meaning continue increasing this value P, up to the point where this cash flow at time zero becomes zero. Because at that point, I won't be interested in buying the contract anymore. So the no arbitrage condition is basically another way of stating this demand supply relationship. And behind this demand supply relationship, we are implicitly assuming that the market is liquid, so buyers and sellers can meet. There's information flow is happening freely. And if that is the case, then it must be that the cash flow at time zero must be less than equal to zero. We must have paid something in order to get a cash flow which pays non-negative amounts in the future. If you set it up, the equation you end up getting that from this equation, you get a lower bound on the price. The price must be greater than the present value. If you reverse the entire story, you sell the cash flow, and you lend CK over 1 plus RK for years K going from 1 through N, then you'll get a bound that goes the other way, that P must be less than the present value. You put these two together, you end up getting a bound that P must be exactly equal to the present value. So this is a long-winded way of calculating exactly a formula that most of you probably know already. In the next slide, I'm going to show you that this power of no arbitrage argument allows us to extend this idea to situations where borrowing and lending rates might be different. Typically, what happens is that the rate at which individuals are allowed to borrow is higher than they're allowed to lend. If I go to the bank and put my money in a deposit, which means I'm lending it to the bank, the interest rate that they would give me, which is RL, the amount of interest that they give on deposits is going to be less than the interest that they would charge were I to, was I to borrow a certain amount of money from them. So RB, the rate that is charged on borrowings, is greater than RL, the rate that is given on deposits or the rate that you can charge on lending. Suppose this is the case. So the interest rates are different for borrowing and lending. What happens to now the value of this cash flow? If the, if the value of, if the borrowing and lending rates are the same, then I know that the present value calculation gives me the price of the cash flow, but now they are different. So my no arbitrage argument still extends and gives us some reasonable bounds on what the price should be. So I buy the cash flow, the same argument that I did a cash, a page before, a slide before, I buy the cash flow and I borrow CK over one plus RB to the K for K years. Cash flow in year K is going to be CK. This is coming from the cash flow minus CK over RB to the K, the amount that I borrowed, times 1 plus RB to the K. This is the interest rate for K years. This is the amount that I have to return, so they exactly cancel. No arbitrage argument tells me that the cash flow in year 0 must be less than equal to 0. If you put everything back together, you end up getting that the price must be given, must be greater than or equal to the present value calculated at the interest rate RB. Now we do the other calculation sell the cash flow, and lend CK over 1 plus RL to the K for K years. What happens to the cash flow? Now, since I've sold this contract in year K, I have to be responsible for paying out the cash flows associated with this contract. So in year K, I have to pay out CK to the buyer of this cash flow. I have lent an amount CK over 1 plus RL to the K for K years. In K years, it matures, this loan matures. And the amount that I get back is CK over R, RL to the power K, the amount that I loaned initially times the amount of the lending rate, which is 1 plus RL to the K. These two terms cancel. I again get that the cash flow in year K is exactly equal to 0 for all K going from 1 through N. Again, my no arbitrage condition would say that the cash flow in year 0 must be less than equal to 0. So what is my cash flow in year 0? I sell the contract, so I get the price associated with that. I'm responsible for paying the cash flows associated with that contract, and therefore I have to subtract out a C0. This is the, pay, the amount that I have to pay to the buyer. And I have lent money away, so all of that is money that is going out of my pocket at time zero, and that must be less than or equal to zero. So from there, you get a bound. It's not a lower bound, but an upper bound 
on the price, which says that the price must be less than equal to the present value calculated at the lower interest rate, RL. So if you put both of these bounds together, this time you end up getting that the price must be larger than the present value calculated at RB, must be less than the present value calculated at RL, but it doesn't give you an exact price. This is an example of a market which we will call later on an incomplete market, meaning that I can't exactly price this particular contract. Most markets are incomplete, and people try to produce new products so that the market can become complete, meaning you can price more and more things. Okay, so how does this price set? How, in typically in markets, you'll have a situation where RL is less than RB, so these bounds are strictly separate. How is the price going to be set in that situation? The price is going to be set by demand supply. The number of people willing to buy, the number of people willing to sell, they're going to come to some agreement within this interval. The price is going to be set somewhere within the interval. If the price, if the sellers are dominant, meaning the, the market power is with the people who are selling the contract, the price would move closer to the upper bound. If it's buyers that are going to be dominant, they will start pushing it down to the lower bound. And where exactly it gets set will depend on what the relative powers of these groups are, what is the utility functions, and so on. In future modules, we are going to talk about incomplete markets and how pricing is done in these incomplete markets. For now, what I want you to take away from this slide is the fact that the no arbitrage argument helps us find bounds for prices, and it extends the idea of the present value to the situation where the borrowing and the lending rates might be different. Next, I'm going to talk about a bunch of securities which are called fixed income securities. These are fixed income securities because they guarantee a certain income for a certain period of time. And I put the word guarantee in quotes because although on paper they guarantee, there is default risk associated with many of these fixed income securities. If a fixed income security has been issued, if this guarantee has been given by a corporate entity, and that corporate entity goes bankrupt, then this guarantee is worth nothing. You don't get any money. So even though for all practical purposes they do guarantee it, there are situations where you would have a loss associated with it. So fixed income securities, which gives you a fixed income, actually are not risk-free because there's a chance that they will default. There's another thing that could happen. The entity that gave you this cash flow is actually not going to default. It's going to give you this cash flow up to the term of the contract, but there is inflation in the economy. So even though you get a fixed dollar amount, the value of this dollar in the future is going to be different from the value of the dollar today. As a result, there is an inflation risk associated with fixed income securities that is not accounted for in, in, the, in the amount of money that you end up getting. There are other products that are there in the market which are inflation protected, fixed income securities that correct for inflation risk. Um, you can buy default insurance on default and so on. So these are some add-on products that have been created in the financial markets to address these two risks that are associated with plain vanilla fixed income security. So the simplest, one of the simplest uh, fixed income security is something called a perpetuity, meaning uh, it pays you an amount A from year one, two, and so on, up to infinity. So it doesn't pay anything right now. It pays, it starts paying from year one, and it goes on until infinity. What is the price for this? We can use the net present value or the present value calculation at some interest rate R to calculate what the price is going to be. I get the same value A in all years. The amount of value that I receive in year K has to be discounted by an amount 1 plus R to the K. So you have an infinite series. If you sum up this infinite series, you get A divided by R. That is the value of a perpetuity. The next complicated idea is that of an annuity. So an annuity pays you a fixed amount A, not from year 1 till eternity, but from year 1 to year N. So it starts from year 1 and ends in year N. So we want to price this. We could, we could set up a formula like this one, and instead of putting infinity, I could, I could write this. Actually, this price is nothing but k going from 1 through n, a divided by 1 plus r to the n. And for those of you who know some geometric series, you can compute this. And the sum of this geometric series is exactly the formula that's given here. But I want you to think about it slightly differently, because it will build up to another idea 
which has to do with superposition of cash flows and linear pricing. So I want to think about that the annuity is actually the difference of two perpetuities. A perpetuity that starts right now, that means it starts paying in year one up to year infinity, and another perpetuity that starts at year n plus one, but it pays a negative amount. So instead of paying a positive A, it pays a negative amount A. Or equivalently, you can say that you are responsible for paying out a perpetuity starting at year n plus one. So that's the cash flow. So the cash flow of the annuity can be thought as the difference between two different instruments, a perpetuity that starts right now and a perpetuity that starts at year n plus one. Linear pricing tells you that if you can write the cash flow of a particular instrument as a difference of two different instruments, then the price should be exactly the difference. In a slide, I'll generalize this idea in a moment, and I'll give you a proof why this is going to be true, or at least argue to you why this is going to be true. For now, just remember the fact that there is a certain amount of conceptual jump associated with by looking at the cash flows being the difference and jumping immediately and saying that the price should be exactly the same difference. But if you believe this, then the perpetuity's cost is going to be A over R. A perpetuity starting at year n plus 1 is going to be worth A over R at time n. But this has to be discounted back to time, one, time 0, and therefore you multiply it by 1 over 1 plus R to the n. And that's how you end up getting the price to be A over R, 1 minus 1 over R to the power n. And that's exactly the same formula that you would have gotten had you started from this expression. OK. We'll come. The next uh, important fixed income security is a bond. So the cash flows associated with the bonds are as follows. There's a face value, F, which is usually 100 or 1,000, and it's typically paid on maturity. There's a coupon rate, which is said to be a percentage of the face value. So a coupon rate of 5% says it's 5% of face value. So if the face value is 100 and you have a coupon rate of 5%, then the coupon is actually 5% of 100 or $5. But it's not paid every year. It's paid every six months. So alpha times the face value divided by 2 is paid every 6 months. So $2.5 will be paid to you every 6 months. There's a maturity associated with the bond. This is the last date at which you're getting a coupon payment, and it's also the date on which the face value is returned. Of course, with bonds, there is a price. You're getting a cash flow, and so you have to pay a price for it. So there's a price associated with bonds, and typically, is also a quality rating associated with the bonds. The quality rating assesses what is the chance that the issuer of the bond will actually not be able to pay you the coupons and the face value back. It assesses default risk. What is the chance that the, the company that is obligated to pay you these payments actually declare bankruptcy and defaults on the payments? So there are lots of different things that characterize a bond the face value, the coupon rate, the maturity, the price, the quality ratings. There is at least five different numbers that describe what a bond looks like. And so if you're trying to invest in bonds, trying to compare bonds, this becomes a very complicated comparison procedure. Five different numbers, comparing them is, is tough. So what people have figured out is to compute something called the yield to maturity. And what is a yield to maturity? It's the interest rate at which the price of the bond is exactly equal to the present value of all the cash flows associated with the bond. So price of the bond is actually something that is available in the market. It gets set by the quality rating, by the face value, by the coupon. So this is, this is something that comes from the market. This C, which is the coupon rate, and this face value is already written into the bond's contracts. And what you're trying to do is set this equality and compute this lambda the interest rate at which these two terms become equal to each other. So there's an inverse relationship between yield to maturity and price, or yield, to, uh, yield and quality. So if the quality is bad, yield is typically high because the future payments are discounted very strongly. The interest rate at which you're going to discount quantities become faster because you're not sure about what is going to happen in the future, so you're going to discount the future very sharply. There's an inverse relationship between price and yield. Yield goes up, price comes down. Price uh, goes up, yield comes down. And that, again, is apparent from this formula. 
And the reason people um, want to think in terms of yields is because it's a one number that summarizes all the five dimensions that we talked about. It has a very nice relationship to the quality of the bond. It has a very nice relationship to interest rate movements. Typically, if interest rates go up, yields go up. Interest rates go down, yields go down. But there is a downside. You're taking a five-dimensional object, five different numbers, and summarizing them using just one number, and there is definitely going to be an information loss. And when you start talking about modeling these interest rates and modeling the term structures of interest rates more carefully, you end up realizing that just this yield number is not sufficient to tell you the quality of the bonds. And as a result, we have to start teasing apart and going back to bringing some of those dimensions back. What I want you to take away from this slide is, of course, the definition of the bonds, what's a price, yield to maturity, but this other notion that in financial markets, sometimes people want to compute a number which is a good summary of a lot of different numbers. And we'll see this later on in equity derivatives calculations when we'll talk about implied volatility. That's another number that summarizes performance in a different way.